Well, hey everyone, welcome back to Pushing the Limits today. I am super excited to have a very good friend, Dr. Greg Brown, to guest. Dr. Greg, welcome to the show. It's fabulous to have you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, really lovely to talk with you this morning. Uh, I had the wonderful privilege of going down to your clinic last week and having a beautiful barbecue with your lovely family, um, having a wonderful meal with everybody there and with your business partner, Mike Winton. So that was absolutely fabulous. So thanks for hosting me. Um, you guys have Wellington Hyperbarics and today's episode is going to be, well, we're, we're going to you know, cover a couple of different topics because Dr. Greg has a very interesting background. Um, but we'll be focusing um, largely on hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, and diving into the weeds there. But before we do that, uh, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about your background, where have you come from, your, your specialties, what you do? Okay. Yep. So as uh, astute listeners and viewers may uh, may pick up, uh, I'm not a Kiwi. Um, well, I am now, but uh, not by birth. Uh, so I, uh, I originate from the UK and uh, trained uh, as a doctor in, in Sheffield in Yorkshire, which is a great place to train because the people are really lovely. Um so I finished up there in 2005, uh, did all my junior hospital rotations and eventually trained in general practice in that area uh, and then came to New Zealand ostensibly for about 16 months, uh, 11, and, <laughs> 11 and a bit years ago. So um, so general practice is my background. I then took a, um, a turn into left field by joining the, the New Zealand military where I spent the best part of a decade in and out of uniform and the the navy was my service um, because i don't enjoy uh, shaving uh, sleeping <laughs> in holes um, or running uh, too far i'm sorry to say lisa talking to you um and then subsequent to leaving the uh, the defense force uh, i've got involved in hyperbaric medicine and in really trying to break the the mold uh, in this country yeah, and, and you're really at the forefront. Uh, what you and Mike are doing is just, you know, revolutionising. I've been banging on about hyperbaric oxygen therapy for eight years. <laughs> I haven't really made much of a dent in the universe yet, um, uh, but it's a, a super powerful. I, I credit uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy with saving my mum twice, um, uh, both, you know, uh, certainly in the in the aneurysm, um and stroke that she suffered seven and a half years ago um it was absolutely pivotal in the rehabilitation of her brain uh and since with the uh cancer that we've been dealing with it's been an adjunct therapy um it's not a cure for cancer it's an adjunct therapy that can be beneficial uh and I certainly think it's had a big role to play in the fact that she's still alive when she was meant to be dead a long time ago um <clears throat> And I'm very, very passionate about it. I've got a clinic. That's why I came down to see Dr. Greg, because uh, he's going to help me with, with my clients. Uh, but you guys have got the the Rolls Royce of hyperbaric chambers. <laughs> I don't quite have the Rolls Royce. Uh, I've got this, a single hard shell chamber and a soft shell chamber, the soft shell you see in the background. But you guys have got the, the real granddaddy of them all. You've got a couple, actually. Tell us about the chambers. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say it's more more a Lexus than a Rolls Royce. I mean, you know, the the, the Rolls Royce um, needs to be seen to be believed. They, they exist in places like Dubai, um, where there's an awful <laughs> lot more money sloshing around than there is in little old New Zealand. But yeah. uh, but yes, we have we have chambers made by a company called OxyHelp, um, and this is a company that does its manufacturing in in Europe, uh, and really, it's it's almost the iPhone of hyperbaric chambers yep i think what perhaps goes unrecognized or under recognized is that the technology has moved on really quite a lot uh, in the last last 10 years or so um and what you get with with something like what we have is a, is a very large degree of, of of automation on the technical side of things so the way that it manages the pressure the way that it increases and decreases safely the, the controls that you've got uh, inside or outside the chamber, uh, it really is next level, uh, as well yeah. as being extremely comfortable, um, very spacious and quite a quite a pleasant place to be. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and and your chamber, of course, goes up to, uh, well, does it go up to 2.4? Is that correct? 
We two. It's, <clears throat> it goes to two two point zero. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we yeah. don't go beyond that. Yeah, yeah, and so and and my one for listeners is is at one point five atmospheres. I would love to have one that goes up to two, but you know we are talking a, a heck of a lot bigger investment. Um, and the one point five can be very effective as, uh, in, in certain things. I would like to have a bit more pressure for for other ailments, but sometimes it's a case of. Uh, get the best you can get um, um, and it's certainly going to be you know sort of massively beneficial um, even at 1.5. Uh, two has got you know s- certainly for things like diabetic wounds or uh, crush injuries or um, after surgeries or uh, even with cancer it would be better to be at the two if you can get access and Greg and Mike have, you know, you've got um, your clinic in Wellington, but you've got some sister clinics in Palmerston North and um, Nelson. That's and right. I've got my one in New Plymouth. Um, there are other ones popping up around the country. Uh, shout out to my colleague uh, who has um, is opening in Pukekohe shortly, Dr. Dean Carter, who managed to get his hyperbaric technician's uh, certification with Dr. Jason Sonners last week as well. So fantastic to have him now qualified in that. Um, and it's exciting. It's an exciting time for hyperbaric. Uh, people are starting to hear the word bandied around and, you know, occasionally people will know that that's the thing that the divers have, isn't it? Or when they get the bends. Can you just briefly go over what is hyperbaric and and then we'll dive into the, the benefits of it? Absolutely. Everybody's minds go to dive medicine if they've heard of hyperbaric oxygen therapy at all. And uh, of course, it is it is the same modality, it's the same principles, but uh, the application of those principles is much broader than generally goes recognised. Very, very simply, it's a dual drug therapy that involves delivering high flow supplemental oxygen at pressures higher than atmospheric pressure. And that's really it. Um, it's certainly better i would suggest delivered in a hard shell chamber from the perspective of the of the pressures that you can achieve um but the um the reality is that it depends on the indication which which sort of pressure you want to treat at and um and there's certainly you know benefit in uh, in, in in both sorts of approaches hard or soft shell but we've we've chosen to go the hard shell route because um we think that especially under medical supervision at those higher pressures we can treat a broader range yep. um, in terms of in terms of how it works there is there is the the upfront effect of direct oxygenation you you do dissolve a very very large amount of oxygen uh, it doesn't just saturate hemoglobin that can happen very very quickly uh, it also uh, puts oxygen directly into the blood plasma and that's just a function of the way the gas laws operate um, but in the longer term and the way that it's delivered these days, uh, there, there are there are other effects around uh, growing new blood vessels and um, increasing the amount of circulating stem cells and actually also epigenetic changes that, mm. that, that are now apparent um, and continuing to be researched. And, you know, and, and the exact mechanisms are you know, very, very complex and to an extent they're above my pay grade. But uh, in, you know, in, in terms of uh, you know, being able to deliver this, um, this safely, the, um, the research base is, is considerable. It's impressive. And it just keeps getting bigger. Yeah, exactly. All around the world, studies are being conducted all the time. I mean, I know Israel is one of the leading countries in this, as well as America. We've got some great doctors like Dr. Harch and Dr. Mm. Jason Sonners, who's been on the show, and Dr. Scott Scher, uh, and many others. Um, and it, so it's hyper oxygenating the body. It's mm. getting the, the the oxygen into the plasma, as you said. When that is the case, then it can actually get through because also the oxygen molecules themselves have been compressed like a uh, can of coke with with the gas in it. Right? It's got you know the carbon dioxide or monoxide, whatever it is, and you open it up and it bubbles out. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's the gas expanding. So that's actually what's happening. It's compressing it down, and then it can permeate through damage tissue, hypoxic tissue, inflammation, where there's inflammation. And these are areas of the body that can be very hypoxic, meaning low in oxygen. I say after surgery, if you've got a swollen joint, if you've, you know, twisted your ankle, um, in the case of cancer, there's more oxygen around the tumors. Cancer does not like uh, oxygen, uh, the blood-brain barrier, 
can get through the blood-brain barrier and rejuvenate neurons that are quiescent that aren't working properly. Can't do anything about the dead ones. Sometimes when you've had a stroke or a brain injury, there's dead tissue that's dead. However, it can help with the rewiring and it can help regenerate these, these neurons that are not quite doing their job properly. Is that, is that an accurate yeah, uh, assessment? Yeah. Or did all, I get anything of, wrong? All of the above, yeah. The, um, I think you've, you've raised an important distinction there between tissue that's, that's necrotic, that's completely dead and is unsalvageable by, by anything, I mean, including hyperbarics, and uh, tissue that's under oxygenated, that is metabolically dysregulated, it's unhealthy, it's unhappy, and you would find that around uh, the area of, a, of, of an infarct in the case of a stroke. So you've got your dead bit of tissue, you've then got what's referred to as the ischemic penumbra. So ischemic, oh, yeah. meaning obviously lower lower blood flow, less, less blood flow than it needs. Um, and it's that area that you can get oxygen into um, and rejuvenate. Um, unfortunately, as I say, the the infarct is the infarct. That's that's gone. But the brain um, is an incredible thing. You know, yeah. obviously, the the younger somebody is, the 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 greater the degree of neuroplasticity. But um, it is capable of making new connections um, and solving solving problems. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, rewiring re 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 itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, given the right conditions and uh, and i mean what what hyperbarics is doing is it, it's essentially attempting to signal to the body hey look there's a there's a problem here go and fix it um as much as anything else and um and, and then the body being a wonderful thing does its thing yeah and it's a you know the the great thing with just hyperoxygenating is you're not introducing a, a toxic substance a drug or anything into the mix it's actually Using the body's own mechanisms, you know, the increase in stem cell production, the increase, uh, the decrease in inflammation, uh, the angiogenesis, you know, the, the the creating of new capillaries and things that can actually help right. reroute things, you know, um, and, and that thing like getting through the blood brain barrier is 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 quite a is is quite problematic. So um, getting the oxygen to damage stroke or or concussion or TBI, and these can be. I mean, obviously, if you've just had a TBI or a concussion or a stroke and you can get into a hyperbaric straight away, then all the better. But it's not that it's um, too late for people who have had these things years ago. It can also be beneficial. And I mean, mum, when she had her, she was 74 years old at the time mm -hmm. <laughs> and now 80 when she got cancer. Um, her brain and, and neuroplasticity, you know, I, I've lived this. I've lived mm -hmm. somebody losing their brain almost completely, being not much over a vegetative state to coming back to a person who can drive a car function fully in society to then going back again after the, the brain tumours to being a baby again and to come back to being a near uh, fully functioning. I'd say mum's operating at about 85%. There's some deficits there for sure now. Um, but she's still, you wouldn't, sitting at a coffee table with mum, you would not know she has anything, only when she goes to walk and things that she's a little bit more fragile and a little bit more unstable. Mm -hmm. But to see the brain go for it like this, complete damage, right back, complete damage, you know, like just absolutely phenomenal uh and it gives me hope for people who are you know definitely for the younger for, for younger people um who are having brain injuries or early onset dementia or alzheimer's or any of these things that this is we need further studies there's a hell of a lot of studies however that have been done in this area and it's not really being recognized um as with all things in medicine hey greg <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Um, and uh, you know, you, you, your mum's story is 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 absolutely incredible, and is is un is unmatched really by anything that conventional medicine um, could offer or did offer in that scenario, right? Which yeah. having 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 read your book, um, is <laughs> uh, it was a it was a fairly wild story of of you know really just frustration um, at a, at a sort of fatalism um, that. That, that that's it you know she's she's had this um this is how things are going to be you know and, and we've we've seen we've seen people 10 years after their after significant traumatic brain injury um and seen unreal improvements you know it's uh it's absolutely not too late um no. the, the, the degree of improvement um and exactly what that's going to look like i think that's 
that is that's the variable that's the frustrating thing you know you you look at what the um the israelis and the americans do using things like um you know spect scanning which is like it's like a yeah. know, fun functional you know blood flow um scan essentially there's there's nothing that that we can do here that um that matches that and no we just don't have spect we don't have it no and, and 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 nothing else is any good you know functional mri is 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 too um is too inherently variable just depending on what the person is thinking about on the day even you know it's um well, it's not a substitute so uh, unlike people who can get spec scans we we can't say well actually that bit of that bit of the brain's gone uh, i'm not going to improve your left arm but i might improve your speech whereas the um overseas people can do that so we've we've got a it's ways to go there yeah. yeah and and i think you know part part of the problem you know as as we've said is that you you are switching on the body's healing and regenerative processes, right? You, you are doing so with something that essentially is non-pharmaceutical. I mean, oxygen, you know, is a prescribed drug, you know, so we, we, we prescribe it. I prescribe it for, for, for the, um, for the patients under our clinic and, and in our satellite clinics, understanding orders, but that's about it. You know, there's no, um, it doesn't fit the medical model. It's not, nice. um, it's it's not getting any traction um because uh it's seen as it's seen as fringe um and it, it you know it's been around for hundreds of years as you've said the evidence base um it yeah, is huge highly compelling and ev every single study that's ever done in 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 its conclusions pretty much you know one of its conclusions is you know needs needs more studies to well, be that's done just but, well, well, you know, we're, we're, answer yeah it, it is it is and you know where do, where, where do you draw the line on that and and i think as well the part of the malaise i guess in 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 evidence-based medicine which has morphed into something that, that that it was never intended to be i mean you know potentially we could get into that but part of the malaise is is really this fixation on the randomized controlled trial mm -hmm. as being the only way yeah. of assessing the efficacy of an intervention now the the only people really that have the money to do big randomized controlled trials that are actually as well as being the gold standard they're also the most manipulatable but the only mm -hmm. people who've got the ability to do that at, at the scale that you need to achieve the power to get the result that you're looking for uh, is the drug companies exactly you need very very deep pockets so when are we ever going to get the same evidence base uh, pro probably never so where do you draw the line and say well actually we've got enough and, and that's the position that, that we came to to then put you know money where mouths are and and to start doing this stuff yeah and, and you know to set up what you guys have set up is next level expensive this is not a a, a, a get rich quick scheme because I can tell you, it's like you've got to do the education. You've got to do you, you know, um, and I've and I've you know done that here too to the degree that I'm able to do that to, to, to do that because we're passionate about this because I've seen it save mum and I've seen it save many of my clients uh, and and have incredible results and I've read the studies and I know that this is an impactful. Uh, amazing therapy but we like you said there's no money behind it. there's no big dollars to be made in this um, area of science and so it's not going to get the attention and you know Jason Saunders has this beautiful analogy um, who's also a hyperbaric expert of um, talking about randomized controlled trials if you had a plant that's stuck in a cupboard in toxic soil who hasn't had any water uh, and it's looking pretty grim and you go, right, I'm going to change the one variable in this randomized controlled trial and I'm going to change and I'm going to give it water and see whether it survives. But it's still in the dark cupboard and it's still in the bad soil. And then you come to the conclusion that the water does nothing. It doesn't help. It's still a sick plant. And, you know, and it goes on the story of changing the soil and the, but taking the water out. In other words, it's the synergy of all these things. Yes, yeah, it's a good analogy, isn't it? Because, you know, if, if you if you ask the question, well, actually, where do we see plants thriving in the world? You know, and what conditions are present? You know, that's that's a really different question. And that's a different way of, of doing the study, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. look at the elements mm. of what makes a healthy person. And mm. let's look at, you know, and this is why I love cellular health and cellular health, like going right down, not even to a systems level, but down to a cellular level mm. and trying to help the cell be optimized, trying to optimize the mitochondria, because I do believe like the mitochondria are absolute key when it comes to optimal health. You know, if your mitochondria are sick, you're sick. Um, and you're not going to have much energy to, to repair yourself, you know, mm. so anything that works on that really sort of deep level, which hyperbaric oxygen does, mm. um, this is, has got to be good. 
and anything that uses natural um the body's natural healing processes is just, but it's doing it on you know i was going to sound steroids it's probably the wrong analogy <laughs> doing it <laughs> doing it extra strong um i mean if i if i just run through some of the things that are, you know can improve brain tissue oxygenation stimulate brain tissue regeneration regrow nerve fibers that's mind blowing. Uh, form new neural connections, regrow new blood vessels, and improve blood flow, stimulating idle brain cells to function. Speed recovery and rehabilitation time. Stimulate tissue repair. Increase levels of neutrophils and nitric oxide. Reduces inflammation in the brain and body. Stimulates upregulation of growth hormones, which we all know is anti aging. Reduces brain damage from swelling, improves cognition, thinking, and brain performance, new collagen, skin, and tissues, reduces pain and swelling. I know this is getting boring me reading this list, but I, I want you to sort of get the point. Regos healthy tissue, skin, and bones, heals ulcers, wounds, and injuries, kills bacteria and infections, makes antibiotics more effective, stimulates angiogenesis and axonal regeneration, enhances mitochondrial function, promotes stem cell production by up to 800%, increases cerebral blood flow, decreases cerebral edema, reactivates quiescent neurons, and it's safe and comfortable and pain-free. Well, why the hell would you not do this? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? And and, and if, if I said all of that um, in a in a newspaper advert, um, the medical council would come down on me like a ton of bricks, even exactly. though even though it's 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 true. It's and, clinically um, uh, provable. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, my listeners might have heard my story about my dad, who was you know unfortunately died two and a half years ago in in, in terrible circumstances in the ICU, and you know, I came with, with the clinical research for intravenous vitamin C in relation to sepsis and the reduction in mortality rates of 48% if you can get it early enough. And I was told, we're not interested in the clinical research. This is a legal matter. So my diet, dad, my opinion, my opinion died because of a legal matter mm. because I couldn't get him what he needed at the time when he needed it. And so one of the, you know, one of my dreams is um, is to, as I've said to you, Greg, is mm. to get the right to try law here, which is uh, they have it in America in some states, where at the end of life, you if your doctors have run out of options for you, you you're allowed to try such things like that, anything that could be possibly helping with a lim with, within limits, obviously of common sense. Um, yeah, of course, and uh, and you know Paul Marek um, proved yes. the efficacy in in the ICU environments really beyond all reasonable doubt, and um, I'm I'm just, I mean I'm not surprised, right? Because I've I've been working in medicine for 23 years, so I, I know um, I know what it's like. I know the sorts of conversations that take place. I know the sorts of personalities involved and the you know the vested interests and um and often just the sheer blinkered arrogance but it's but it's actually pro still profoundly shocking yeah, to it is. hear um to hear an experience like yours um and I, I and I don't know I don't know that there's an easy fix for that you know because it is a it is a cultural thing within medicine and part part of the problem you know back in back in the day you know if, if we go so when I when I was a when I was a young doctor, or when I was a medical student, you know, before before all the before all the grey hairs, um, <laughs> the uh, the whole evidence based medicine thing was coming in, you know, and it was like this is this is fantastic, right? Because you know what we used to do was eminence based medicine. You know, you you had your eminent professor. You know, I, my first job as a as, as a qualified doctor was for the professor of surgery in Sheffield. You know, great great job. You got the professor. He he, he knows he knows his stuff. Um, you do. You, it's an apprenticeship model. You train mm -hmm. under this person. You do what they do. Um, you learn from them and their experience. You add your own experience to that, and you develop an, an approach that then works for you going into your career. And hopefully, you keep learning and keep uh, evolving in that sense. Um, that there were issues with that model and you know certainly there there is a, a huge place for doing you know decent scientific trials in in medicine um but the way that then that evolved was for evidence-based medicine to become the new version of eminence-based medicine just with more arrogance and a and, and a bigger brick bat to hit people with who who didn't um comply with what somebody on some guideline committee thinks is the right thing to do right yeah. so i think you know in a sense you know as, as some in, in, in my gp work i mean I, you know i i 
almost hesitate to say this publicly, but I mean, I think I, you know, walk a, a tightrope between what I think in in my experience and my reading of the literature and everything else, what I think is in the best interest of my patient, and what I think I can get away with without being branded, you know, a, a bad doctor, quote unquote. Yes. Um, you know, because those those guidelines that doctors work to, the things that say, for example, you know, vitamin C is not to be used on the ICU, well, those guidelines are developed by guideline committees. Those guideline committees invariably involve uh, specialists of a single um, single area, you know, the cardiology, know about stuff, the cardiology yeah. guidelines, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. By the time it comes down to general practice, uh, you've got you've got a highly filtered view that's focused on that one disease or or one body system. There are usually four or five drugs for each one of these things. Yeah. Uh, and you start to add that up, you end up in a situation of polypharmacy, which is where which is where we are, you know, people being on really, I mean, five or more drugs is is a, is a problem in my view, because you've got you've got really no idea what the interaction between those things are. Um, but the key thing is, that guideline is then constraining that practitioner, because that guideline is then the standard against against the which that doctor is, is, is judged. Yeah. yeah. So you know, if, if then there's an adverse outcome and the doctor is shown to be not practicing according to the guidelines, they can be disciplined and censured for that. Um, yep. and, and fundamentally, that means that that contract, that contract between the doctor and the patient, you know, that involves such old fashioned notions as, you know, informed consent and shared decision making. Right. You know, that, <laughs> that, has, that, that has largely gone out of the window because yeah. the, the, the guideline says it. If I don't do it, I'm a bad doctor. Therefore, I have to do it now. I, I, I skate close to the edge on that um, yeah. and uh, and I'm probably a much lower prescriber than some of my colleagues um, yeah. but it's still but it's still there you know and and in the case of say you know IV, IVC or um or, or hyperbarics um it's not in the guidelines so um we haven't heard of it and, and we've had that locally here from from a stroke physician um yeah. in a meeting with with patients and uh, concerned family and friends who said well we've ne we've never heard of this um so how could a stroke physician not have heard of hyperbaric? Yeah, I don't, I don't Even understand. Even if it's not you'd available. Be, yeah, you'd have to have your head in the sand, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Like, I know that the state of, you know, the amount of research that's going on in the world and the amount of research that's coming out that no one doctor can be across everything. That's just absolutely impossible. Nobody can. Yeah. And we, we have to specialise and stuff. But, you know, the, the specialties, even like the, the, you separate the cardio, the, you know, the, the heart from the lung guy, you know, like, or, or these are interrelated um, systems. And I, and I get the, 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 you know, the reasoning, uh, someone who's a specialist in the heart can't possibly be a specialist in what's going on in the brain, but these guys need to talk to each other more. And, you know, arrogance needs to be put aside that you don't know everything, I've, you know, like I've come across arrogance, like, you know, just a couple of weeks ago and I was in the hospital, mum's got a GI bleed. She's nearly died from blood loss twice. The blood, the level of blood in her body was, you know, horrifically low. Um, the bleeding stopped on its own accord. They sent her home again and without any any diagnostic. And, uh, and I'm doing the research and I'm seeing that MRI and I'm talking to my doctor friends outside of the hospital and they're saying, yes, MRI is a good diagnostic tool for uh, such bleed. Um, I go to them and they, the, the, the surgeon, I came prepared with the research, it, like a court case. Every time I go to the hospital, I prepare like I'm a lawyer going to fight a battle in court because that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, he, he, as soon as I got half a sentence out of my mouth, he said to his junior staff, take care of it and just walked off to the next one. And I was just like, oh, hey. you know, like, <laughs> and she was sent home in an extremely fragile state, knowing that if, if she had another bleed, she wasn't going to make the hospital, you know, and I'm, and I, and, and, and I, I've gone then since that point, gone to my doctors outside and said, what the hell can I put in to, to make sure that she doesn't bleed now? And we've gone hard out with things like peptides and BPC 157 and glutamine. And we've gone, you know, all the natural things the microbiome stuff is it's all we got, right? It's all I've got. And is that enough? Um, touch wood, she's doing okay again. She's bounced back again and her bloods are back up at sort of, you know, reasonable levels, still slightly anemic, but uh, reasonable levels again, so that she may survive another bleed. But this is the frustration, right? They don't want to spend 
the $1,300, whatever it costs for an MRI for an 81 year old who's got all these comorbidities. And, and so they'll just don't... tell you that it's not a diagnostic tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and you know, fundamentally, they, they don't they don't want to be uh, challenged in any way. You know, nope, they don't like it, me. It's, yeah, I'm. I'm sure. I'm sure they don't. Um, but that that <laughs> attitude, take care of it. I mean, that is that that that's profoundly shocking. Yeah, it is. I, yeah, I, can... I just. <laughs> and my brother was opposite me, and he thought, "Oh God, here we go." You know. <laughs> but yeah, but the you know, in those circumstances, they also have you by the balls. Yeah. Because if you're rude to them, then you're really in trouble. Because mm -hmm. then they really shut down all of the support that you can possibly get. You know, and that is the this precarious position that the loved ones are in when they're fighting for their 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 family member. And so by sharing those stories, and these have unfortunately been over and over and over again stories. So goodness knows, and and, and I, I I hear stories back because I tell these stories. So people come and tell me their story. So I hear this over and over and over again. Um I share these stories so that the person who is in that situation knows that they're going to have to fight for resources, that they're going to have to fight for their loved one, that it's not going to be automatic and that you better push back and that you better go and do your own research as best you possibly can. And yes, you'll be rubbish and yes, you'll be ridiculed as, oh, you're coming with Dr. Google, are you? Well, I can tell you that all of these stuff is that you have access to, I have access to as well. There may be a few hidden papers that I don't have access to, but I can get them through my doctor colleagues and friends that I have. Don't treat me like an idiot just because I didn't go to med school. <laughs> I think these days that's probably an advantage, to be honest, not having yeah. gone to med school. Yeah, it is an advantage because you, you know, you you can you you you're not like this with your hand up the back. And I know really good doctors who, like yourself, are going. It's just so frustrating. I know what I should be telling this person. I can't say it. I can't do it. And this is where we need to change this model. And I think this is where people like me sit, uh, also walking fine lines sometimes. Um, but we have to be brave because we're standing up for the people we care about and our clients and, and, and their loved ones to get the best that there is available. You know, in hyperbarics is like, well, this one's a no-brainer for most people. There are a few contraindications. Um, yeah. And on that note, we, you know, we did one yesterday. We had a client that was under your uh, consult with you to, to, to make sure that they were okay to come in. Because with hyperbaric, what are some of the contraindications where you'd say, oh, we have to have a look at a bit closer here? Yeah, there, there, there are a few. There's There are relatively few absolute contraindications um you know a uh, a pneumothorax a uh, you know collapsed partially collapsed lung um is definitely one um because that's going to get uh, you know significantly worse and possibly tension um and um, and you don't you don't always survive that so that's that's a yeah, that's a bad thing but also you would look quite carefully at people with chronic chest disease or previous chest surgery in that regard right so if somebody's got really awful emphysema so that they've got these great big dilated um sacs called bullae in the in the lungs that could burst um and cause a pneumothorax um so that would be that would be a, a big thing um you've then got um, certain uh sorts of chemotherapy that if you're within a few days of them, uh, there can be effects. That there's there's a couple. We won't, won't bother about going through what they are, but there's a there's a couple there that we just have to be a little bit careful of. Um, and then you're talking about um, things like um, uh, sinus issues, middle ear issues, you know, things things that are going to be a problem under uh, under pressure. Uh, diabetes, you have to be a little bit careful with just because blood sugars can drop a bit in the chamber so um you know essentially it's just a case of checking blood sugars beforehand and making sure that it's not uh, not lower than a okay. than a reasonable yeah. level so you, you've, you've got a bit of wiggle room there for it to drop um but those those sorts of things you know we've 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 got a list here i mean I, I i don't like people going in after recent dental treatment because sometimes the pressure can actually cause a tooth fracture if there's a you know if there's a cavity there or some you know some defect so um we we screen everybody and we've got a you know standardized Tool that, that that we use to to do that to look specifically for all the contraindications and and also just to take a general view of somebody's health 
Uh, and then I, I speak, so certainly in terms of what we do here in Wellington, I talk to all the patients initially, um, make sure that there's nothing there in the background that we haven't picked up, brief them thoroughly on how to manage their ears in the chamber. And then I will go in um, for the first session because we have the luxury of that with a multi-place chamber. I can go and sit in an adjacent seat and just keep an eye on them through that first treatment and make sure that they've uh, they've equalised their ears properly and they're, they're pain-free and enjoying it. So um, as you say, overall, very safe. Few absolute contraindications, some relative ones that you just have to be a little bit cautious about. Um, and uh, yeah, touch wood, we haven't had any major issues up to this point at all. And we no. haven't perforated an eardrum, which is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know these these things we need to to know about. Um, and and then there's the thing, you know, people might be hearing this and go, right, I'm 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 going to come, and I've got I don't know major concussions that I've had in the past, or something like that, or stroke or whatever. Do I just need to come once? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is also no. <laughs> if if only, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and this is and, and and this is the thing. I mean, this this is the other barrier to treatment, especially where the um, the public healthcare system don't come to the party. You know, this is a um, this is relatively expensive uh, and uh, it's extremely time consuming. So you know, if you've got if you've got a, a historic a traumatic brain injury. Um, something really even moderately complex then you're you're going to be needing you know 40 to 60 sessions of this and that and that is far better delivered um in you know consecutive weekdays you know five days on a couple of days off at the weekend um consistently for several weeks where where people do that they have much much better results we yep. find that's what um, i found and and the the ability to dedicate that much time on a daily basis is is a luxury um for some you know that yeah. they just can't that they just can't afford and i think you know like that you know on on that note you know it depends on the severity of the condition too mm. so some people don't need a full 40 but someone yeah, like mum would you know like mum's been doing it or oh, we do have the occasional break where she has a month off here and there mm. uh and that's part of the protocol too that you know but um Basically, for the eight years, she's had hundreds and hundreds of, of, of hyperbaric treatments. I've lost count when I got up to 400 or something. Um, so it is, a, you know, something that can be ongoing, you know, and, and supportive. But if you've just, you know, like my brother just had a hip surgery, uh, hip replacement, and I was trying to just get him to do three treatments before, three treatments afterwards. Absolutely. We've managed the after. <laughs> didn't come before um but just those three would have been beneficial going into surgery and you know two or three afterwards just to speed that recovery so it doesn't always have to be a you know a block of yes, 40 yeah 100 percent. yeah so you've got you, you've got something so post-surgery would be one um and you know there, there is there is benefit even to just one um post post-surgery for wound healing one of yeah. the first patients i treated was my wife because she very unexpectedly developed acute appendicitis last Ooh. last year on on, on mother's day um <laughs> Which, uh, which fortunately I picked up early. We managed to get her in. The, the, the surgeons took twelve hours to scan and pontificate, and eventually go. Oh yes, it is. The dumb GP was right um, with his hands and his eyes and his ears. Um, but uh, you know, she she then she was actually then one of the first patients, quote unquote, that uh, that that I took through our our new chamber that had recently arrived from from Europe and. Uh, uh and three sessions afterwards i mean the wound healing was absolutely primo and it was laparoscopic so i mean we're, we're, we're not talking great big wounds here but uh, it was absolutely superb and i think you know the the other thing around that would be you know we, we talked about um adjunctive uh cancer therapy um radiotherapy you know if people are undergoing radiotherapy you know the, the trouble with trouble with that is the the huge amounts of friendly fire you know the collateral damage that you get from all the surrounding tissues you, know, you think about you're really hard to treat conditions like um, radiation cystitis if you're having um, irradiation to your prostate gland, for example. Uh, having hyperbarics, you know, ideally concurrently, but you know, alternatively straight afterwards, is is really going to minimise that because we're we're healing we're healing wounds, we're healing burns, whether they're on the inside or the outside, and wow. um, it doesn't necessarily need that many to achieve that effect and to at least limit the damage there, there there are some there are some forms of radiotherapy i think particularly head and neck that's just absolute hell on earth i mean i i, I think yeah. back to the worst medical job i ever did in my life which was an oncology um rotation um back back in my native sheffield and it was you know 
heinously understaffed and um and, and just just really uh, a, such a traumatic experience that I about six weeks into the job I developed um uh, pomphilix you know did, yeah. um, sort of a you know, particular sort of stress related eczema um okay. I can sort of say what the hell's the matter with your hands boy you know I'm like oh I don't know boss but um, yeah, I'm this job. but you know the the the, the level of, of 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 the mucositis that people get you know mouth um oh. where, where they just can't eat from from this stuff it is it is your worst nightmare I I would love to see radiotherapy patients getting hyperbarics as absolute standard you know it's it's it really is a no-brainer and a before and after in that case because you know lots of people have to go for radiation and yeah. radio radiotherapy and 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 um one of uh, i have a friend who's just producing a movie uh maggie um maggie bradley and she is mo- making a movie called cancer e- evolution and it's all about the metabolic approach to cancer and she had metastatic cancer stage four like tumors everywhere i think there was something like 80 tumors like She's got the MRIs of the tumors and it's just insane. And she wasn't meant to live. And obviously and she did the whole metabolic approach and has healed herself. And now she's years down the track and she's making this movie about the metabolic approach. Right. Awesome. And she said, the only thing that I've got um, damage from is the radio the radiation. Hmm. Um, and if she'd known now, she could have done other things to prevent some of that damage that she has ongoing is a, is a problem. Hmm. Um, so, you know, this is a, something that you really, really want to think about if you are stuck in that horrible position of having to have that. Um, in a, you know, it, there are reasons to have it for certain things in certain times. Um, if you can do something to mitigate the suffering, this is what I, what I, you know, what frustrates me because I, I, I have a very preventative mindset, like like just because I've experienced such horrific things in my life with my family and myself even, um, it's like, hell no, I don't want to go there again, you know, like just to save me or save my family, you know, what am I missing? So I'm constantly studying and researching to be in that preventative space so I hopefully you know, can catch things early and stop things, horrible things happening to us. Um, and you can't obviously take all the risk out of the universe because something's going to come and hit you sideways that you yeah, didn't think about that. <laughs> There's always something that you're sure, shit, I wish I'd studied that now. Um, however, I can mitigate a lot of the risk and I can repair after the damage has been done. And, you know, like if I could just, if I if you can put people into the into the brain of mum after her aneurysm for a few days and then bring them back out as, as to their normal self they would be not eating the rubbish they would not be drinking the massive amounts of alcohol they would be losing the weight they'd be going to the gym because they would know how horrific that journey was you know and when you can when you can transfer that this is what it feels like i mean you know even with my brother the other day he wouldn't come prior to the surgery after the surgery, it was like, oh, when can I get in? You know, because it was worse than you thought because you've forgotten how bad it is and how bad the pain is. And we as humans tend to do that. I know with ultra marathons, you get to like you in the middle of the ultra marathon, you're going like, never again am I going to experience this pain. This is horrific. Why the hell am I doing it? And then you get across the finish line and you're never again. And then when, within 24 hours, because of the excitement, you finished, you got the medal and you've forgotten the pain. Well, you've delivered the baby, you've got the baby, you've forgotten how bad the birth was, right? And then you're off planning the next one, the next race or whatever. <laughs> That's I'll what take we your do word for it on that. Hey? I'll take your word for it on that. <laughs> you forget, though, the pain and the suffering that you went through very, very quickly. Whereas I try to, like, no, <laughs> uh, let's be preventative. You know, and I try to get this across to my healthy clients who come is let's do some baseline testing while you're healthy. Yes, it's some money and investment now, but if you do that baseline testing, then when things start to go south, we've got, and I'd love to go and get, you know, MRIs and things like that. So we have a complete, you know, and clearly scans and things like that, have a complete data set of what is you healthy. And then when things start to go pear-shaped, then we do another and go, oh, that, you know, your hormones have dropped off a cliff or your you've got a, a spinal you know scoliosis that's now starting to develop in the last two years and we because then we can you know make a comparison and you can actually see mm. um you know but that's not always doable 
because there's no, always that's right. resource that's to right. run. And, and 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 sometimes as well. I mean, you know, screening and uh, you know going on fishing expeditions for uh, for for problems before they manifest um, just increases the amount of time that you know that you have a diagnosis. You know, without being able to to uh, to change the outcome. But I guess I mean it comes it comes down to what what your paradigm of of preventative um, healthcare is, right? Because you know gen- general practice has a has an idea of of what that looks like. And I you know got to say, I mean it, it's it's. <laughs> It's fundamentally un- un- unsatisfying medicine to do, really. You know the b- micromanagement <laughs> of, um, of of risk factors, um, and that's that's really what it's all about. You know, if you know, everybody has a, a cardiovascular risk assessment that's you know that's based on um, lipid profile and um, and blood pressure and you know family history and a few a few other things, blood sugars, that 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 sort of thing. Uh, it spits out a, a a percentage risk that may or may not be accurate, and then um, the algorithm says, you know, this this person needs a needs a statin. Um, consider this, consider that, consider the other. Um, and you know, e- even even in my you know twenty year career, I mean, I've I've seen I've seen the pendulum swing so many times. You know, aspirin's a good thing in primary prevention; it's a bad thing in primary prevention, or maybe it's all right for some people. You know, and and when you've got the patient in front of you, I have to. I, I tend I tend to go to the 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 online risk calculators where I can show them what the benefit of an intervention is, because yeah. the reality is that the majority of the time uh, it's extremely modest. So you look at figures like the number needed to treat. You know, it's a good sort of stats measure. Um, it's the reciprocal of the of the absolute risk reduction. So it it really just tells you how many people need to have this intervention for one person to benefit. You look at things like you know blood pressure and and that sort of thing. You know, it's 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 sort of in the order of you know eighty you know to a hundred depending on whether you're talking about stroke or heart attacks. Um, lipid lowering in um, in uh, low risk people is a is a complete fool's errand and, and i think you yeah know, and a you dangerous could, one really because yeah you need cholesterol you know you could, this yeah, whole I mean, argument the whole hypothesis i think is 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 actually fundamentally wrong and is based on 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 bad premises i mean that's been rehearsed by you know by by lots and lots of people far smarter than me but i mean i you know i discovered malcolm kendrick's work on that very early in my career i think i was a gp registrar so i was about to pop out um as a specialist generalist at the end of the of the treadmill and i'm thinking holy cow this is um this is really bad. Like we, we've we've based um, an entire industry um, on 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 a, on a study that was extremely fraudulent, um, and and also um, policy that came out of the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, related to our food and our diet. So, I mean, you know, you've you've got micromanagement of risk factors, and then you've got what what is actually prevention. You know, which which starts with nutrition. And you you asked me the other day. Um, how much nutritional training I'd had at med school, and um, and I, and I had to say, hands on heart, I don't remember any, right, none at wow. all, you know. So that's something that that I have had to educate myself on um, yeah. post grad. You know, did a did a fairly deep dive on that stuff, um, you know, just over a decade ago. Wow. Um, you know, discovered um, the, the the you know the sort of paleo movement. Some some of the people you've had on your podcast, you know, yep. so a- avid consumers of Rob Wolf and people like that, and yep. uh, uh, fixed fixed my own health that way. I've got quite overweight sitting sitting on my fat backside in a in a GP's <laughs> chair, advising people on on nutrition that wasn't working for me. You know, so then the power of that and the the, the, the oh. broken nature of the medical paradigm was 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 then very very obvious to me. You know, um, and movement. You know, um, <laughs> you you've got one expression of that. That's awesome. You know, there are there are multiple That's expressions, so and 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 just just <laughs> getting patients to walk, getting people to walk every day. You know, you do twenty minutes of walking a day. That's achievable for most people. Um, even in New Zealand, with its frequently shocking weather, you can just put on a better coat and go and, and go and do it. So, you know that that's one aspect. And then you get into like really basic stuff that, for some reason, um, is the preserve of of functional medicine because conventional medicine doesn't want to touch it. But I mean, goodness me, you know, vitamin D. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know how how During many pandemic, how many like, studies hello. do we need? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Um, and there was a there, there was another. There was another fantastic study that came out quite recently, um, and I, out of Canada, I think, and it was a it was a ten year prospective study of um, of people, you know, so two groups, vitamin D, no vitamin D, in a place that obviously gets even less sun than we do, um, 
and they showed that um, the risk of Alzheimer's was was dramatically reduced. And you could see those two the, the two lines start wow. to diverge after twelve months. I mean, it didn't take very long for that to for wow. that to be the case. I we we cannot in New Zealand we cannot do publicly funded vitamin D tests. The patients have to pay for it, right? Yep. And then I ask you know, every doctor to do everyone for my yep. clients. And some doctors have done it, have, have done it, but I've mostly send them to my tests, which is mm. an online thing where you can self-order, pay the $25, get that tested. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah, we obviously we, we can request it, but 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 they have but they have to go they, they have to go and pay for it, which is which is okay. But you know, why why is that the case for vitamin D? You know, why yeah. is it the case that the only formulation that we've got is that is the massive there's a massive dose um, supposedly once a month? You know, for, yeah. For, what is with know, that? Yeah, and because it's why... always confused me. Like fat soluble vitamin, and you know, mm -hmm. like I'm a fan of five to ten thousand I use, so quite high dosages per yep. day. Especially uh, like yep. I do genetic testing, and I if I have my client and I've done genetic testing, I might see uh there, there's three genes involved with the with the or three main ones involved with vitamin d you know receptors of transport and activation genes and if they've got poor genetics we definitely want to know what your vitamin d's are and then usually it's a five to ten thousand iu dose with k2 by the way d3 yeah. plus k2 yeah um and, and it's just like a no-brainer there's this i don't know 700 i want to say processes in the body that vitamin d is is um implicated in uh, that, that, that we system. know about, yeah. Yeah, bone health, adrenal, mm -hmm. you know, the adrenal system, HPA axis, there's just so, so many. The Alzheimer's was a new one on me. I didn't know that one. Yep. Um, and, and and this is a so cheap, so easy <laughs> to fix. If, you know, in a time of COVID, why were we not handing them out on every street corner? Yep. Some uh, countries did. Some countries did. Yeah, but, uh, but, but not, not not us. And 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 therein lies the problem. It's it's cheap. So yeah, I I personally take uh, five thousand units in the in the mm -hmm. summer months. You know, between daylight savings times and and ten thousand in the in Me the winter. And, and that's and that's the result exactly. of, of of having done some levels back in back in the UK. Um, and seeing that five thousand just wasn't wasn't enough to optimize my levels. Um, so you know where you can go online at the moment and you can buy that um we have to import it in new zealand i guess your your um us based and other other uh, viewers and listeners won't so won't necessarily know this but the maximum that you can buy in new zealand i think is is a 1000 iu yeah. um tablet you know which is yeah. which is very highly subtherapeutic you may if, if that's all you're taking every day okay but you may as well not bother um, or you're taking multiple, and it's and it, and it then does become expensive. Whereas you know, that's you why I imported it out of the states. Yep, me too, me too. Yep. And, and 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 that's that's so that's so basic, you know. And then you know, vitamin C and zinc and some of these other these other basic things. I mean, you know, you you imagine a public healthcare system that prioritizes these things, not <laughs> statinating the population and and constantly shifting the thresholds lower and lower and earlier and earlier in life where you start to look at these things. I mean, you know, that's. Um, that's how you improve health. Yeah, I mean, on the cholesterol, medicine. cholesterol front, you know, why is this an overly simplistic view, and why can't we get, you know, LP little A and PLAC and apolipoprotein A and B? We can actually now online order those two, actually, particularly okay. um, uh, through my tests, which great, go and do that, people. Um, but but explain to a little bit the the whole cholesterol panel. If you, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here, but um, why is that a very simplistic overview when we get the cholesterol, we get the LDL, the HDL, the, the um, coal HDL ratio, and that's it. Why is that not enough info? Yeah. Um, they, 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 they measure the stuff that's easy to measure uh, and then prescribe drugs that, that target what you can measure. And of course, we know that just because something can be measured, it doesn't necessarily mean it's important. Um, and the you know the converse is is true. Uh, yeah. So the the cholesterol the standard um, cholesterol panel. Quite. I'm, I'm I'm saying cholesterol in in inverted commas because yep. um, we know that it's not as simple as that uh, in this country at least includes the um, the total cholesterol, which is you know people look at it and they go, oh, your total cholesterol is high. And I go, mm. so what? Meaningless. Yeah, it's actually you know, good. If, it if, you're a, function, if, if you're a woman hormones. particularly, it's 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 way better. Um, you've then got um, LDL, which is a calculated value. And 
LDL is made up of different subfractions of different sizes. Some may be um, implicated in, in heart disease, most are not. Um, and then you've got the only two that I actually look at. To be honest, I, I ignore total and LDL and I look at HDL and triglycerides. Um, essentially, you can infer quite a lot about somebody's diet um, just by looking at those two measures the triglycerides are going to be raised in a situation of standard western diet lots of refined carbohydrates you see very high levels in diabetics and they get brought in to see me to go oh their triglycerides are high do you want to give them a drug and i go no they need to improve their glycemic control um yes. ideally through diets not through um not through the medications if, if we can get away with it so that's that infers something about the carbohydrate levels. And then the HDL is often a, a proxy for how much natural whole food fats people are eating. So somebody on a somebody on a on a you know paleo primal, low carb, high protein, you know, LCHF, however you want to you want to term it. Gotta keep colleagues like Grant Schofield happy by mentioning LCHF. <laughs> um, which he I seem to remember uh, yeah, at a meeting he rebranded as low carb healthy fat, which I think is much is is, is much better. Um all yeah, of all of those approaches, they they're, they're going to they're going to raise your raise your HDL in most cases, and they're going to lower your triglycerides. And if you've got a ratio of high HDL and low triglycerides, um, low idea, triglycerides like, being under one point three or under one. Well, I mean, I, ideally under one. I think I think the last time mine were measured. Um, in fact, this 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 is how much I how much store I set around doing lots of blood tests. So the la the last set of blood <laughs> tests I had done on myself were just prior to my second immigration medical when I decided to stay in the country. And um, and back then they were still doing fasting lipids, which is which is a nonsense for everything apart from triglycerides. Um, All right. And. Uh, I, uh, I I ate four eggs cooked in butter um, before going to uh, to have my cholesterol test done, um, and um, my HDL was was two in our units, which is different in America. Yeah. My my trigs were were zero point five, you know. So wow. you've got you, you got a, a four to one ratio, so you, you can easily easily get it under one um, yeah. with a low with a low carb diet. That's the only thing worth looking at. Yep, yeah, that there, there are much more complex um, tests that can be done that we that, that, that we can't do, and that's not really an area of of, of my practice in any detail at the, at the moment. Um, but certainly, this fixation on total cholesterol and LDL. Yeah, like my my, my total nonsense. cholesterol came back the other day at a blood test, and I do like to do blood tests because I do like to read. Uh, you know, like what's I'm going for optimal, not what the ranges are. Sure. Not the, and, and you know that's the way I've been taught by by my my teachers mm. is to look for the optimal and you know trying to you know things like albumin you know the the albumin should be nice and high and you know lots of lots of nuance there but um mm. that that can help us but my 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 um HDL come back at three which I was quite shocked at myself nice. Very good. <laughs> and that was quite high but the doctor was concerned about that and should be closer to two they thought and my um trigs were 0.7 I think nice. and um my LDL was too high though it was uh what was it but the ratio was okay but the the whole yeah and the total total cholesterol was seven mm. it's very high right and I'm not panicking because <laughs> my yeah. hdls are high you know and again I, I probably should go and do a do the the other ones but i'm still learning those ones the apolipoproteins proteins and all of that well i think i mean you can you can infer quite readily from that from that ratio of hdl to triggs that that the ldl that you have is is likely to be not a problem it's likely to be the larger you know larger fluffier ldl um without without necessarily the need to dig into it um Unless you, you know, obviously yeah, you're, you're you're particularly interested, so yeah, perfectly fine to do that. But uh, you know, again, talking about skating close to the edge, yeah. Somebody like you would be brought in um, by the practice nurses who get the blood results back and go, okay, you know, whoever signs them officers, bring them in for a you know for a chat about about their cholesterol. Um, what we're supposed to do is to have a conversation about uh, low fat diets and <laughs> um, and statins, and then I, I have go, a high fat diet. <laughs> yeah, and and then I look at that and I go, well, from your diet, looks like you're doing this and this, and these, you know, I'm usually right. And I go, excellent, carry on, don't darken our door again. <laughs> um, do do not worry about about your cholesterol again, and particularly for females. You know, it's very very clear that um, that you lot, and yes, I did just assume your gender. You lot run a a higher uh, level generally than us, and that is extremely helpful going into the later years. Um, exactly for, why for general and, longevity, yeah, and for hormonal. So you know, yep. I want my hormones to be the best they can be. I am on mm -hmm. HR two, full mm -hmm. disclosure, um, <laughs> as well, um, but. Um, Bioidentical HRT, by the way. Um, 
but I want my brain functioning well, you know, mm-hmm. and I want my membranes to have the good fats. And so, yeah, I do take the good fats, you know, I do pour my olive oils and a bit of butter and, uh, you know, things like that, that <clears throat> the evil butter, <laughs> you know, um, it's not, a, you know, the carbs, we, we generally have too much carbs, I think, you know, and um, simple carbs in our diet and god i love them as well it's bloody hard Mm. that sourdough that your wife made the other day beautiful it's it's pretty special uh, yeah i have to 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 limit that that. yeah yeah but you're right i mean yeah certainly um acellular acellular refined carbohydrates real issue um you know uh, plants carbohydrates uh, potato kumara something that we've got here like a sort of sweet potato is uh, is absolutely delicious really really fantastic especially you know post-exercise um, to refill your muscle glycogen but you know that's a that's a particular situation and and the time you know the timing of carbs you know matters the timing of carbs the circadian rhythms yeah. of things we're much yeah, more right. uh, insulin sensitive around you know lunchtime and then there's a mm-hmm. genetic component which i you know there's a huge genetic component to this so um you know you want to know what time of the day and how often that's what we can help with the genetic testing mm-hmm. um but yeah in other words yeah the the, the the standard guidelines that come out you know the food pyramid and grant schofield you know he's been on the show too and he's just like you know um blowing all that stuff apart you know and it's all yes, upside yes. down we shouldn't be having a ton of grains we shouldn't you know we we um definitely don't we should all be trying to avoid gluten as much as possible without being anal about it mm-hmm. you know but we want to be don't follow the food pyramid you will get sick and don't follow the rda on the vitamins and stuff because it probably won't be enough you know what is it like vitamins i've I've interviewed a ton of vitamin c researchers and they're just like trying to get the vitamin c rda put up to the you know from what is it 50 milligrams or something to 100 when they know that Actually, we need a shit ton more than that Absolutely. for optimal health. But they're not even trying to go there <laughs> because, well, no, if you can't get it in one, you know, serving of kiwi fruit a day, then it's too much to be putting on the RDA because it's unrealistic. No, it is what it is. Like we need to be optimizing, um, you know. And then this is why I'm so grateful to, you know, have you as a friend now to um, have – doctors that are willing to have these brave conversations and i think you know without getting too political we need brave conversations we need open conversations and we need to have less censorship more open discussion uh intellectual debate you know where did all that go it just seems to have disappeared in the last few years where we've got this dogmatic overreaching Mm. 100 percent yeah that's 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 a that's a that's a whole other conversation but i mean to give you an idea you're you're returning to to hyperbarics you know we we can't um we can't take out google adverts okay so we can't really i haven't even tried to do that yet for hyperbaric so this is this is the extent of the this this unholy alliance of of big tech and the medical industrial complex that because this is a quote-unquote unproven therapy they won't let us advertise wow and we we know, we, we know darn well how much search results are, are, are manipulated and things are down you know down rated um so oh, that yeah. they're hard so that they're hard to find and 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 it's been obviously the most egregious during the um the last three years um but it is continuing to occur and yeah. uh it it affects you know all of us who have uh, approaches that are not considered by somebody somewhere to be mainstream yeah, and, and, and evidence-based and and who is that exactly and who is that that is standing that judgment yeah yeah exactly mm. and you know I, I mean I've I've seen it I've spent 10 years building a brand I've spent 10 years building a audience um a couple of the people that I had on the show who um, weren't of the mainstream opinion, shall we say, <clears throat> I had to take a couple of my podcasts down. I was censored immediately mm-hmm. and I can't, I don't have the resources, the income to withstand an attack like that. I'm not Joe Rogan. So I had to take them down, you know, and that that's, that's me, the little fish, you know, this is happening all around the place, censorship is a, is a very big problem. We need to have open, you know, discussions. And that's, you know, we're not inciting anything. 
We're not doing anything right. bad. We're not saying we're just saying let's have intellectual debates on this stuff. This is the thing. It's you know the 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 marketplace of ideas, right? The free exchange of ideas, and may the best one win. You know, if you yeah. if you don't if you don't like what I'm saying, refute it. Give me a better argument, and I'll listen to it. You know, it's it's so fundamentally um, unscientific that it's that quite frankly it it's it's a bit dystopian. I mean, I think I I I worry about I worry about really the the totality of the medical evidence that I am resting my practice on in the in a conventional sense right because so much of it um is likely false you know the one one, one yeah. of the most cited papers ever is John Ioannidis um paper um from two it's from 2005 it's from the year I graduated and I think I read it that year uh, and it probably had a somewhat disproportional effect on my practice but uh, you know that 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 paper was entitled why most published research is false wow you know yeah uh, and and if we can't challenge if there is a if there is an orthodoxy a, a a correct a right opinion that is staunchly defended that cannot be debated um we're in trouble actually yep. we're, in, yep. we're in massive trouble because we are essentially then controlled um in relation to to our health and well-being um there are some opinions that you can't have there may well be some approaches that you can't do. You know, we, we, we're facing down a very significant um, act of parliament that looks like it's going to yeah. go through in New Zealand that will, that will substantially. Bill. Yeah, yeah it will, terrifies it will do, me. Yep, yep. Therapeutic products bill. It's um, it's absolutely horrific. It's going to reclassify um, natural health as um, as medicines under the same uh, regulation regulatory framework. Yep. Um, and we're going to end up with um with our choice being fundamentally restricted in that area. Highly yeah, like down to this point where you won't be able to get vitamin C or you mm. won't be able to do your natural herbs in your garden or you won't be able to uh, take any, you know, uh, and, and this will be controlled by who? Pharmaceutical companies, you know, well, or that's government. Right. Yep. Um, we, you know, like if you look at Maori medicine and traditional medicines, mm -hmm. they are going to be gone. Mm -hmm. Their entire, you know, this is a horrific over. Um, this natural therapeutic bill has, to, and and it's slipping in under the radar. It is. You it know, is. I had the privilege of going to a big natural health conference um, recently, where I was speaking, and um, they had a representative from the government there who was talking about what they're doing with a natural therapeutics bill, and I tell you, she got completely roasted because the Excellent. CEOs of those big companies that were there. You know, and I won't name names or anything, but they were like, you haven't even asked us as an industry what we think. You haven't let us submit anything. We're taking our company, one of them said, we're taking our company that has over 500 employees and we are buggering off. Hmm. You're not giving us the ability to get the export licenses. You, you are hindering this. And they were angry. Yeah, and, and, and this is, you know, like... People don't know this is happening because they're really good at just bringing things under the radar Absolutely. and slipping and, it in the dark at night. And it's not just New Zealand. There is there are similar moves in in North America. You know, yep. it's, um, one it, of it my really... products has been taken off the market in North, in North America. Mm -hmm. Nicotinamide mononucleotide, a really powerful, great anti aging NAD uh, booster. Mm. Um, that's been helping a lot of people around the world. In America, they've taken it, you know, because that, it's going to drug discovery or something. So that people are not able to get that anymore. Mm. The, uh, they have to go offshore if they're going to get it. Good for us because they come offshore. <laughs> they buy it from us, you know, or other companies. But this is not, you know, this this worries me, you know, on, on so many levels, this worries me. And you always have to look at where is the money and, like, you know, the amount of lobbying in, you know, American um, politics is, you know, the obvious place to, to look where the billions of dollars is you know, in lobbying government and who's putting that behind that in the pharmaceutical companies, the, you know, the, 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 the powers that be. It's not about your health. It's not about personally, you know, you making an assessment. And as a doctor, you know, when you've got a person who's sitting there before you, you've got to do public policy for one in 1,000 people, this is going to be a benefit. And for the others, it's probably not. We're going to give it to you. You know, that type of decision making is just like, shouldn't you be looking at that person and all of their data points and making the best assessment for them? I find the best thing is to give them the figures and say, does that, does that, uh, does that, reduction in risk from 15% to 12% excite you 
And they go, not really. And I go, cool, me neither. <laughs> and the side effect list is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How, how exactly. about we don't how about we don't do that? Cool. Yeah. Exactly. And then you have how to about document we change the diet? To, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, and do a bit more exercise and try to make some other changes somewhere else. <laughs> uh, Dr. Greg, you have been absolutely amazing. Thank you for sharing so openly and honestly on the show. I really, really do appreciate that. Um, thank you to you and Mike to, for setting up Wellington Hyperbarics. And there's Nelson and there's Palmerston Hyperbarics. And now there's one in New Plymouth. That's me. There's a new one coming up in Auckland and Pukekohe. There are others in Auckland as well. My my friend Dr. Dean will be and Mary Ann will be opening in Pukekohe. They're going to have two hard shell chambers. This stuff is coming, <laughs> and why is it coming? Because it works. So um, you'll be able to find this near you, hopefully soon, if not now. Um, and ring and contact Greg at Wellington Hyperbarics. Where can people find you, Greg? So we have the domain hbot.kiwi, hbot.kiwi. That's pretty easy, hbot.kiwi. We'll put the links down below. Uh, otherwise, reach out and, um, you know, check this out if it's something that you need to think about. Dr. Greg, thanks so much for your time today. Very super grateful. Thanks ever so much, Lisa. It's been wonderful.